When the railways began to spread more than 200 years ago, their impact on architecture was nothing short of revolutionary. To serve these marvellous machines, whole new kinds of buildings sprang up. From the outlandishly ornate... The things you find on buildings. ...to hidden gems. I never thought I'd get to see this. ...and railway wonders of the world. Now, this is what I call extreme train spotting. Now, with privileged access... We are swinging. Oh, my goodness. ...and rarely seen designs. Oh, this is the famous watercolour. I want to show you how each and every one of these remarkable structures tells the story of how the railways have changed the way we live... You're standing in the middle of history. ...forever. Today, I have the rare privilege of seeing a striking post-war station through the eyes of its architect. It had been told to deliver a new station and didn't have to worry about money. That was your brief? <laughs> that was my brief. <laughs> Beside the Great British Seaside, I discover the birthplace of Britain's funicular railways. The actual base of the tram is the original, and we never had a crash landing into the station. And in an exciting TV first, I get to delve into the treasure trove of Network Rail's incredible archives. So here are some very early George and Robert Swinton drawings. Oh, Climb aboard as I explore the architecture the railways built. The history of railway architecture around the globe is the story of movement, the ebb and flow of passengers across countries, over land and rivers, and even under the sea. The design of a station building is the important opening chapter to that story, and my first stop is a perfect example. Coventry in the West Midlands. There's been a railway station here since 1838. More recently, a new extension was added in 2022. But, as ever, it's this railway station's fascinating past that I've come to explore. You might think, for a chatterbox like me, it'd be a fate worse than death to be sent to Coventry. But if it's to uncover the story of a station with a pedigree like this one, I don't mind at all. With its striking lines and bright interior executed with precision, Coventry Station was part of a radical 1960s rethink of what a British railway station should look like. But this distinctive slice of modernist design in concrete, glass and hardwood wasn't welcomed by everyone. It owes its existence to an urgent need for rebirth and reconciliation, as too does much of the surrounding city. On the 14th of November, 1940, Coventry suffered the most concentrated aerial bombardment of any British city in history. Over the course of the Coventry Blitz, very few of the city's landmarks escaped unscathed, and the station was no exception. The level of destruction was so complete, the Nazis coined a new word to describe it. Coventryan, meaning to raise a city to the ground. After the war, the task of rebuilding began, and this station was one of many radical projects to rise from the ashes. And, thrillingly, we don't have to look back through the archives to see the plans. Because 60 years on, the man who designed every last detail is going to be our guide. Now 96 years old, Derek Shorten became the project architect for the new Coventry station back in the 1950s. What was it like? Can you give me a sense of what it was like when you first came here? He was just rather like an out-of-town station with rain shelters, a temporary booking hut, Nothing much to write home about. No, but it all changed, of course, as soon as the uh, competition was won by Sir Basil Spence for 
the building of the new cathedral. After its destruction during the Blitz, the rebuilding of Coventry Cathedral began in 1952 under one of the greatest British architects in history. In preparation for its opening, the chairman of the British Transport Commission, General Sir Brian Robertson, made a promise that by the consecration date, there would be a new railway station commensurate with the quality of design and materials to that of the new cathedral. The man for the job was the then 33-year-old Derek, part of the in-house British Railways architecture team, who was fresh from completing a new station at Barrow in Furness. My boss called me in and said, I've got a, another job for you, another station to do. The head of the railway said, you are obliged to use the best possible materials. And my boss said, just get on with it <laughs> and do it. Nobody ever interfered. Nobody really came to look what I was doing. <laughs> it, was, it was one of these dream jobs where I was, had been told in 1959 to deliver a new station by mid-1962 and uh, uh, didn't have to worry about money. That was your brief? <laughs> that was my brief. How did you go about researching or getting inspired for this station? I went to Scandinavia just before I started designing the station. I went to Denmark and I wanted to talk to Arne Jacobsen, the great designer of all things. And that was uh, a great help to me because he then showed me his other buildings, particularly a school nearby. For six decades, Arne Jakobsen was at the forefront of Danish architecture, creating buildings that still appear modern and forward-thinking today. Although it hardly resembles a school at all, the Mungagar building is considered one of Jakobsen's most important works. And it provided Derek with the inspiration he needed for Coventry. I wanted huge pieces of glass as in the concourse, and it had to be resistant to the most severe gales. Look at that huge, those panes of glass. That's right. I'm really excited. And it, it, I wanted it set in the new American material, neoprene. It had that resilience to enable you to have huge pieces of glass. Nevertheless, when the station was finished, and very high gales were predicted. I came to Coventry, <laughs> just to make sure, secretly, <laughs> <laughs> and I saw the most remarkable thing of the glass undulating in the huge gale. And it was obviously all safe because it was properly bedded in the upbringing. Well, thank goodness for that. As promised, Derek finished the station in time for the Queen to attend the consecration of the rebuilt Coventry Cathedral in 1962. But the cathedral wasn't the only new building in Coventry that would welcome Her Majesty. You must have stood there on that opening day when the Queen walked through and all the, the pomp and ceremony was going. How did you feel that day? Well, um, I had been asked uh, by the station master if I would be on hand just in case uh, the royalty wanted to know something about the new station. And I said, no, it's the people's station and therefore I will be, just stay in the background. And very tired, I'll be very glad I finished it. What was reaction like generally to your station at the time? I think it's nice that when people started coming to see the new cathedral, that they halted in the main concourse and looked around and said, this is lovely. <laughs> and one of them dared to say, which I soon shot him down about, he said, it's better than the new cathedral. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't the only ones Derek impressed. That year, Derek was awarded a Royal Institute of British Architects Prize. 
And in 1995, this iconic station received its own important honour, becoming a Grade 2 listed building. What we ended up with is a building that is rightly celebrated yes. 60 years on mm. because it is so pure in its concept. Yes. How do you feel about it being Grade 2 listed? It all seems from the point of view of now that I'm 96, as something like a dream, <laughs> because things like that don't happen <laughs> in the architectural profession, but they did with me. Yeah. And, and I didn't, I wasn't answerable to anybody. <laughs> I just did it. Now I've heard from the architect himself, I can't wait to explore the station in depth. There's a typeface up there that's wrong to my eyes. Oh, that is a real nerdy point, Tim. I'm at Coventry Station, a cracking example of the modernist style of architecture which would come to dominate the design of our railway stations for decades to come. It's functional rather than fanciful. Modernist architecture is much maligned, but it can't be that bad, right? Because after 60 years, this station is almost entirely unchanged and still works perfectly. And that is testimony to its great design. The true beauty of modernist architecture lies in its simplicity, its clarity, its lines. And one example of Coventry's superb style, which still serves passengers today, is its large concourse. The success of the station owes much to the fact that project architect Derek Shorten didn't design just the building, but oversaw every decision on the interiors as well. So, is everything on this station effectively bespoke? I specified everything, what I wanted, but particularly things like glass. In the main concourse, there's a, a glass balustrade on the half landing there. Yes. And I found some glass that had been made by the old process. It was undulating and uneven. And I said, that's exactly what I want. So that as you walk down the concourse, you see this slightly uneven sort of glass with the uh, daylight shining through it. And it worked. Modernist architecture can be underappreciated, but I'm meeting a real champion of the aesthetic, Catherine Croft from the 20th Century Society. What is it about this space that you love? I think I just like the mix of, the, of how practical it is. It's a really simple diagram about how to get from your train out into the city. But it's also, it's really glamorous and really generous spaces. Um, it's just sort of all the best things about modernism. It's really, really dramatic. This huge glass and hardwood balcony provides passengers arriving and departing not just with a fantastic view, but with a real theatrical flourish. It feels about there's something exciting about arriving in Coventry because you come down this very broad staircase, you, if you're meeting someone, they get a little glimpse of you when they're right at the top, and then maybe you, know, you can lean over and say hi when you get to this point, and you get great views out into the city. It's almost like being on a catwalk or um, being in an opera house or something. It feels like you're kind of celebrating your arrival. I love that. I love the idea. It's a celebration of travel, isn't it? Yeah, it's about arriving being something exciting and, and, and travel being something exciting. Um, and, and yet it is also an incredibly practical utilitarian building with really robust finishes that will stand up to everything. And it's worn incredibly well as a result. From the ground, the bridging balcony is revealed to be a gravity-defying piece of modernist magic. It's this big staircase and the balcony 
is actually it's not supported from underneath. It's all hanging from the ceiling on these steel rods. I haven't spotted that. That's I mean, really very amazing, amazing. Isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's, it yeah. is really and it means splendid. you've got lots of freedom to plan how you want underneath. You don't have to have supports. The upside down nature of the supports means that under the stairs and balcony, the space is rather cleverly left uncluttered. That's the thing, right? This whole station has been built for the efficient throughput of people as fast as possible, as well as being a very pleasant space. Yeah. It's incredible how 60 years on, apart from the addition of brightly coloured window graphics, it's remarkably unchanged. I love just the, the breadth of the, of the roof here and the way it's all lined in this timber. It's quite a sort of Scandinavian feature. And then you've got the very consistent rhythm of the fluorescent lights. I love the way these columns, uh, which are again covered in a, a, a white tile, which I think was actually from Sweden. Really? Um, and they step back from the glazed facade so that, you know, you see them as a, an object in space rather than just part of the structure holding the building up. Even the advertising boards and seating were personally designed by Derek to fit into his modernist aesthetic. Those advertising cubes and the benches, where did that idea come from? I like the idea of heavy cubes sitting on little thin pedestals. In my mind, subconsciously, that's the way it worked, sort of the precariously sitting on a little <laughs> sort of <laughs> thing underneath. Derek's cubes and benches almost resemble a series of minimalist sixes sculptures, but not everybody was a fan. I love these because they're so chunky and robust. But when the station first opened, the Architects' Journal published an article about it and it said how incredibly uncomfortable these benches were <laughs> and how there weren't nearly enough of them. But they've certainly stood the test of time. They just look absolutely indestructible, don't they? Well, so does the station. It's funny, isn't it? People often say that modernism is a temporary thing, but it isn't. The, the, the station has gravitas. And it feels like the whole thing has been built to last. Definitely this has been built to last. And for the real buffs out there, my eagle eye for all things railway has spotted something unusual. But there's a typeface up there that's wrong to my eyes. That is not the rail alphabet that I see everywhere else in the network. Oh, that is a real nerdy point, Tim. <laughs> oh, I do like my typefaces and fonts. The rail alphabet font we're so familiar with was rolled out across the networks with the 1960s as part of the corporate rebrand that transformed British Railways into British Rail. Its designers, Jock Kinnear and Margaret Calvert, were tasked with creating a font that was clear and simple for passengers to understand while on the move around stations. But six years earlier, while Derek was working on Coventry, the pair were designing a new font for a new concept in Britain, the motorway, and Derek immediately recognised its potential. I did all sorts of unorthodox things to ensure consistency. I just asked Jock Kinnear yes. if he would do the slightly varied script that you would need for the rather different conditions on the railways. It's another example of Derek's almost mischievous design. Left entirely to his own devices, he was able to get away with mini rebellions like this. From the minute details of its prototype signage to its trailblazing architecture, this station is a rare example of a singular vision shining through. It was costly here, in one sense, uh, because they had to use very good materials, like the Swedish tiles, like the, uh, uh, the wood in the concourse, but I never thought about it. I knew that nobody was going to even dare ask me about the cost. <laughs> I'd had my instruction from the chief officer of the railways, no matter what you need, I will, uh, uh, I will uh, vouch for. That's and incredible. He did.
Coventry Station is a monument to forward-thinking architects and engineers pushing boundaries to keep us passengers in motion. But that approach isn't all that modern. Railway people have been doing it for centuries. An industrial estate on the outskirts of York isn't exactly we'd expect to find a treasure trove of remarkable railway architecture. However, hidden inside one of these buildings is just that. This is Network Rail's National Record Centre. And we've got exclusive access to show you the treasures it holds for the first time ever on TV with the help of archivist Vicky Stretch. What a treat. I've always wanted to have a look in here. Well, it's about time, Tim, and you're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Vicky. I'm at Network Rail's National Record Centre on a magical backstage tour with archivist Vicky Stretch. And we've just hit the mother load. <laughs> <laughs> what is all this? So in this room, what we have is the Railway Registry of Deeds, which is documentary evidence for the ownership of all the land that the railway has owned past and present. To operate Britain's railways, Network Rail owns an extraordinary amount of land throughout the UK, nearly 52,000 hectares. That's roughly the same size as the Isle of Man. Vicky, there are acres and acres and acres of this stuff. This is the working archive. These allow us to get access to the line. They give us our rights of way. They prove ownership to the land. So members of staff are coming in here and pulling stuff off shelves to look at them even today? Absolutely. They might be 19th century deeds, but we absolutely use them for the 21st century railway. There is a mind-boggling amount of material in here, including the original master plans for routes the railways would take right across Britain. So this will be the parliamentary plan for the Cornwall Railway. And if we have a look inside, what they did was they surveyed the line and produced these maps of where they were going to build their railway. And then these plans and the written bill would be presented to Parliament. And this line is where they were proposing to build their railway and the line of deviation that says we're going to build it between here and here. Look at this, it says, land belonging to the Earl of St Germans. Yeah, and if you can see here, these little notes yes. with the conveyance, the conveyance number, that will correlate to a document that we have in this Registry of Deeds. I'll be quite honest, I had no idea you guys had all of this stuff in one place. Your archive isn't just a history of the railways, is it? It's a history of the whole country. Absolutely, and how the railways changed that landscape. And as if that wasn't enough, Vicky is going to show me the crown jewels of the collection. This is the archive room, and this is where we keep all those plans that are sprinkled with a bit of archive magic. <laughs> so here are some very early George and Robert Stevenson drawings. Ooh. This is really unusual. This is a drawing from 1839 from the York and North Midland Railway. But what's interesting about it is that it shows two different arrangements for standard gauge railway. So we've got these arrangements here that are on stone blocks. Yes. And this is the more recognisable arrangement on timber sleepers. So this is like the crossover period when they were starting to do sleepers across the tracks. Absolutely. It's a very early experimentation between the two. This newfangled idea. Absolutely. The tracks being a standard gauge apart. Oh, Temple Meads. Absolutely. So this is the original watercolour. It's almost like an artist's impression. This is what we're going to build. And it really shows it in its context with these beautiful horse-drawn carriages and the people standing outside. I can't tell you how much this means to see this, but that gothic splendour. It's no secret that Bristol Temple Meads is one of my favourite stations. And having visited more times than I can count, it's a delight to see how that splendid front facade was planned on paper. 
I've seen prints before, but never the original. And this is a very special moment for me. Now, I know that Bristol's being refurbished at the moment, so the team down there must need to have access to these drawings quite a lot. They do. Temple Meads is a listed building, and so when they have to produce the conservation reports and reports into the history of the station in order to get permission to change those listed structures, they come to us for the original drawings to tell the story of those, of those buildings. And it's from this very archive that we found rarely seen documents relating to places we're visiting throughout this series. This is just wonderful. There's so much skill, so much beauty and of wonder in all these drawers. I, I feel I could spend, you know, weeks here actually now you've given me the keys to it. <laughs> I'll see you in a fortnight. <laughs> <laughs> As we've just glimpsed in those remarkable drawings, the Victorians were an innovative bunch when it came to getting from A to B. The advent of steam-powered travel enabled the masses to flock far and wide, including to the seaside. But the railway's contribution to a good day out didn't end there. Scarborough on the stunning Yorkshire coast. It was Britain's first ever seaside resort, thanks to a 17th century publication, heralding its natural spring water as a cure for all ills. And by the mid 18th century, sea bathing here became the height of fashion, with the gentry using horse-drawn bathing machines to transfer them modestly from beach to brine. But this resort of magical waters and weird contraptions has an even more delightful claim to fame, because it's home to the very first passenger funicular railway in the country. Now, if that's not a great reason to pack your bucket and spade, I don't know what is. I'd like you to meet Adrian Perry, president of the local civic society and an expert on how Scarborough became Britain's funicular railway pioneer. We're in the South Bay of Scarborough, and this is the bottom station of the cliff lift. It was opened in 1875, and it was the first passenger lift funicular in the country. Scarborough has some beautiful views. But the reason why you get all these beautiful views is because it's hilly. When this was built in 1875, they actually advertised that for one penny, travel on the lift and avoid 260 steps. This groundbreaking feat of engineering was an ingenious solution to a very pressing problem. In the 1870s, Scarborough Spa was the most popular music venue outside London and the need to link South Cliff Esplanade at the top to the spa at the bottom must have caused much Victorian head-scratching. From the top, it's clear why 19th century day-trippers were reluctant to make the journey by foot. When the railways came to Scarborough in 1845, it absolutely changed the game for everybody. Scarborough used to have trainloads of people come into town on the day trip, and there were 9,000 people just in, you know, came into Scarborough just at one go. Those excited holidaymakers would have been drawn to the mini grandeur of the upper and lower stations. With large windows, intricately carved fascia, and decorative wrought iron detailing, no expense was spared, and people clamoured to ride to the trams. They were designed by consulting engineer Mr Lucas and built by the Crossley Brothers of Manchester at a cost of £8,000. The pair of counterbalanced cars, attached by a cable, ascended and descended the steep gradient, carrying 20 people each. By 1888, it was being used by 250,000 passengers a year. When we visited, it was closed for repair, but after 147 years of sterling service, I think we can forgive it for needing a bit of TLC. 
The Southcliff lift was an immediate success. People found out that it was the quickest way to get down to the beach, and it was the quickest way to come back up, and it only takes a minute or two. This is a very important part of transport in Scarborough, and, of course, this was picked up by other resorts all the way around the country. Rather delightfully, a further four were constructed right here, adorning the Scarborough Cliff Line. The second was built in 1878, just over a mile away, to attract tourists north of the headland. The ill-fated Queen's Parade tramway served the North Bay and its promenade pier. But a series of mechanical failures led to its closure after barely a decade, with the connecting pier destroyed by a gale shortly after. The St Nicholas lift opened in 1929 on the south side, linking the Grand Hotel with a subterranean aquarium. And just a year later, the North Bay got a new lift, linking tourists with the area's new bathing pool. Sadly, nothing remains of the North Bay site, but the St. Nicholas lift is now a quirky cafe, the rear extended into what must be the world's only funicular dining cars. So, until the original South Cliff lift reopens, Scarborough has just one functioning funicular. The Central Tramway. It was actually the third to be built and has just celebrated its 140th birthday. It's like trundling back in time. Scarborough's Central Tramway has been pootling up and down from the Grand Hotel to the beach since 1881, and delightfully, not much has changed. Thanks a lot. Just push, little man. Push it. That's it. Commissioned by Central Tramway's chairman, John Woodall, and constructed in just six months, it opened to the public on 1st of August, 1881, to a rapturous Victorian crowd. This funicular, the third in Scarborough, was an immediate success, transporting almost 3,000 passengers on its very first day. In the 1920s, the switch was made from steam to electric and the Central Tramway's future was secure, now making 300 daily trips during the busy summer season. And the old machine room is just where it always was, underneath the tracks. Drew Martin has been operations manager here for six years. So the engine room as you see it now has been here in its entirety since 1881. The trams operate on a counterbalance system, so as one goes down, the other one comes up. It's a very eco-friendly system. It uses a very minimum amount of power to actually operate the trams. What you can see behind me is a 60-year-old David Brown Radicon gearbox that drives the electrical power supply to the main sheave wheel. The main sheave wheel is driving clockwise currently, which means that it's hauling up the Grand Tram. And surely the best bit of Drew's job is that he gets to drive the scenic trains. So I'm closing the doors now currently. I'm going to press my dead man's and start, and the tram is now good to go. What a way to spend the day. Of course, now the driver and passengers are protected by modern safety features. But back when it was built, the job was a little more hairy because the driver operated the trams from beneath the tracks. There was a hemp rope that held the two trams together with a rag on, and wherever the rag stopped in a certain position, that is when the brake would have been applied and the tram would stop. I'm pretty sure they would have had a few collisions into the stations in them days. 
Unfortunately, that's not something that can happen in the modern era. Thank goodness for that. Much of the exterior is very similar to how it looked in 1881, with its distinctive painted timber and original ticket office. It was built in Chairman John Woodall's garden, strategically sandwiched between his home and the Grand Hotel, then the busiest in Europe. General Manager Helen Galvin is up at the top station. What I love about the building is actually it's all its history. The building is exactly as it was 141 years ago. And what we have today is exactly the same colours as it was in 1881. Actually, the tramway to the beach sign, originally it said tramway to the beach and entertainments. So obviously there's a lot of fun going on even in them days as there is today. So again, nothing has changed. Those cream and red hues are certainly reminiscent of the old Midland Railway, something which helped make this new, groundbreaking invention feel safe and familiar to nervous Victorian travellers. Clever move. And, rather thrillingly, preserved within the company archives is a ledger full of tantalising information about all those early passengers. We've actually got an awful lot of archives dating back from 1881. Um, it gives us a lot of information about how many customers came through the, um, the turnstiles, and we know this because the turnstiles are original. They've got a little clicker system, and we've got it to this very day. It gives an indication about how much cash we took every day. But what I do find is interesting, that actually it shows that dogs were carried. So whereas our passion for dogs is today, it's actually the same 100 and... 40 years ago. There are also records of the forward-thinking local shareholders who chanced their money to fund this funicular. So we know uh, at the very beginning there were 695 shareholders from all sorts of backgrounds. They all bought into the tramway and obviously they could buy as many or as little shares. It gives the name, um, Percy George, he was a carpenter. Um, there's, you know, we had a, a butcher, banker's clerk, chemist, a gentleman, so all sorts of people from different backgrounds actually investing, which is actually in the time was a really high tech investment. And the trams that are hauling passengers up and down today are incredibly well cared for and beautifully maintained. Only recently this year we've actually had a brand new chassis being built, which is a big deal for us. We've given it a lot of tender loving care just because, you know, it deserves it. The journey only lasts about 40 seconds, nearly 50, but actually then the last 10 seconds, as we can feel now, is actually the brakes being applied. It's a real safety feature that we've added just to add extra security and we never had a crash landing into the station. Glad to hear it. The cliff lifts in Scarborough are an exciting chapter in the history of our railway architecture and those protecting them today are just as passionate as their shareholders were in the 19th century. I'm very proud to be following in the footsteps of other people who've looked after the tramway. It gives me an enormous feeling of, of pride to actually be part of the team that maintains the, the tramway on a daily and yearly basis. And with such a dedicated team preserving this historic funicular, it looks to me like Scarborough's central tramway is safe for another 140 years. The Victorians were geniuses at moving people around, but they weren't the only ones. I'm at the modernist masterpiece that is Coventry Station, where I have it on good authority. There's a secret slice of social history just behind those rectangular slivers of window on the upper part of the concourse. And if there's a hidden area of a station, rest assured, I'll root it out. Luckily for me, Tim Headley jones of the Railway Heritage Trust has the keys to unlock this undercover relic. Oh, 
Oh, look at this. This is a great view, isn't it? This is beautiful. It's looking down over the booking office onto the main concourse. These days, we're used to stocking up on travel supplies from the usual station chain shops. But back in the day, catering staff played a huge part in keeping passengers fed and happy. And many of them lived on site. Hello. Oh, look at this. That is rather odd for an office. <laughs> this is obviously some sort of living accommodation. It is. It's where a bedroom was. Someone had a bed sit here. They lived over the premises. Women had been employed working in catering occupations really ever since the start of the railways. And the hours which some of the refreshment rooms operated were very antisocial. So it was a great advantage to have people who could live over the premises. People felt that single women couldn't live on their own unchaperoned. And so a manageress who would look after them, and that was how, the, how they lived. That's quite an anachronistic view, isn't it, I suppose, of society. In the 1960s, so the, the, kind of the, the organisation being the sort of overall parent of its staff. I think we're seeing here a building which is at the cusp of a modern era, but harking back to traditions that date back to the Victorian period. Oh, this is lovely. So, like, a single person's accommodation. You know, you've got, oh, look at this. Look, you've got a little, oh. Where the socks went. <laughs> <laughs> British Railways standard socks, I hope. Exactly. This hidden corner of history is a wonderful reminder that Coventry Station was created when Britain was undergoing huge changes. For the first few years, some steam trains still belched onto the platforms, allowing passengers to alight and flood through the modernist concourse, the past and the future colliding. For me, this station is a fascinating milestone in the development of post-war Britain. You must feel secretly quite proud, because yes. 60 years on, it's not changed. No. It's great to listed, meaning it's one yes. of the best yes. in the country. Yes. I look back in a funny sort of way, it was great fun, because I was answerable to nobody, and I just got on with it. I've travelled through this station a hundred times before, but I've never had the chance to get off the train, let alone meet the actual architect. Now, I've always known this is a good building, but now I can see it in a whole new light. Next time, a railway bridge puts me in a spin. This is amazing. I'll explore hidden depths. Well, here is an architectural treasure trove. And hit the roof at a great station. <laughs> I think we're being laughed at down there. <laughs>